This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And this is the day that we gather as a church family to worship together. Even though we're not here at the church uh, facility, uh, the church building, we are gathering together to worship God. It is our prayer that you are safe, that you are well, and that you're riding out this uh, unusual time that we're experiencing. So friends, let us now prepare our hearts, our thoughts, and our minds for a time of worship. So this week, uh, Tom asked me to come up and, and do a song this week, and uh, he made a request for a song that he wanted to hear. And then uh, that afternoon, Presley made a request for a song that she wanted to hear. And uh, Presley's gonna win that battle probably about 100 times out of 100, so sorry about that, PT. Uh, and then, in all fairness, I never even heard the song that he asked me to play. Uh, but Presley said, she was on the couch, and she said, Daddy, she said, uh, sing the one where, the song where it's, I will build my life. And that struck me because that's the bridge of the song. It's not the chorus, it's not the first verse. It's kind of a unique place. Uh, but it struck me because in this time of uncertainty that, that the line that she would latch onto was, I will build my life upon your love. And so it's a childhood story about the, the foundation that we all have as Christians and believers and building our lives on a, on a firm foundation. And so when the storm come, we won't be shaken. And so uh, this is a storm that we're in. And, um, and as believers, we shouldn't be shaken. We should be leading the charge of, of not being fearful right now. Uh, that's not always hard to do, but it is, it is a certainty that we know how this story ends. And so uh, in this trying time, our circumstances might have changed temporarily. Uh, but our destiny, our eternal circumstances have not. Nothing is, has wavered. Nothing has changed. And so we know that, and there's a confidence to that. Um, so think of that maybe a little bit as we sing this song. Uh, sit back, listen to it. Sing along if you know it. Uh, whatever you want to do, this is totally different. Uh, but thanks to Presley for requesting it, and uh, I hope you all have a good morning. <laughs> Show me who you 
Hear the reading from Psalm chapter 27, verses 1 through 5. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then, I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in this dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 2 Timothy chapter 2, 8 through 13. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying, If we died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. May God bless the reading and hearing of God's word. In nearly all of Paul's letters, he says the same repeated phrase, I long to see you. I long to see friends in Philippi. I long to see you in Thessalonica. I long to see you. And even though I've not been shipwrecked like Paul, even though I've not been imprisoned because of my faith like Paul, uh, this call of shelter at home, I, social isolation and physical distancing um, has caused me, like Paul, to long to see you again. I truly miss being with you all. I truly miss hanging out with you. I truly miss having fellowship, Bible study, and worship with you and look forward to our time together for fellowship and Bible study and worship. It is my prayer as your pastor that you are well, that your family is well, and that you are keeping your faith uh, during this most unusual time. Please know that I pray for you and we'll continue uh, to pray for you. As we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, we pray God's blessings upon our church family, upon sister churches. We pray for leaders of our nation, our state, our community, and really leaders around the world. And we pray that God, in God's power, would stop this virus. Will you join me in prayer? Almighty God, it is to you that we look for help, 
it is to you that we look for salvation. And we pray, God, that this morning as we worship you, that you would be honored with our gathering, that you would be honored by our worship. God, we confess to you this morning that we are people in need of a Savior. We are people in need of forgiveness. And we believe that forgiveness and salvation is found in Jesus Christ. This morning, God, you have heard our request. We pray for your will to be done. And we pray, God, that you might stop this virus right now. And we pray that healing around the world would begin even at this time. God, we pray for our leaders. We pray that you give them wisdom. We pray for our nation as we pray for the world. We pray for unity and that we would come together and love and support one another. And God, we pray for those who are sick. We pray that you would heal them. And God, through all of this, we pray that we keep our eyes focused upon you. And we pray all of this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, friends. We miss you at Brook Hollow. We hope that you're staying well as you're social distancing. We're social distancing, too. But since Harrison is my son, we can be close together since we're in the same house. Right, buddy? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we hope that you've been enjoying the sunshine this week and getting out. Thanks again for the jokes that you sent in last week. Those were so funny. Harrison is going to share some jokes that you guys submitted this week. All right. So this one was submitted by Seth. And it's pretty funny, so here we go. What do you call a plant that runs on electricity? I don't know. What do you call a plant that runs on electricity? A power plant. <laughs> a power plant. Good one, Seth. What else you got? All right, this one was submitted by Luke. What do you call a cow with no legs? A cow with no legs. I don't know. What? Ground beef. Ground beef. Good one, Luke. Those are great. Thank you, Seth and Luke. You are so funny. It's been really great to laugh this week. This week, we want to talk to you about music. I know that you all love music. Your question for the week is, what songs make you happy? Think for a minute about songs that you like. Songs that make you happy. Harrison, what songs make you happy? Um, I like Matthew Begats by Andrew Peterson. Mm -hmm. Like your shirt yeah, here? Shirt. Yeah. What else? Um, I like Himalayas by Scott Mulvihill. Good one. And um, some songs by George Harrison. Oh, songs by George Harrison. Good. Good ones. Thank you for sharing. Cool. Well, we have all been learning, Is He Worthy? by Andrew Peterson. That's a song that we've been singing together the last few times that we were at church, preparing to sing it together in worship. And I look forward to the day that we can come together and sing Is He Worthy in worship. I hope that will be very, very soon. Music is such an important part of worship. A number of songs in our hymnal were written by a woman named Fanny Crosby. Yep, that's a name that we don't hear very often anymore. Her name was Fanny Crosby, and she wrote To God Be the Glory, Blessed Assurance, and a bunch of other songs that you and your parents may know. Well, when Fanny was six weeks old, she had an eye infection. Her doctor was out of town, and a man posing as a doctor, gave her the wrong treatment. Within a few days, Fanny went blind. If that were me, I'm afraid I might be really mad. I'm afraid I might spend a lifetime feeling, feeling sorry for myself. But Fanny's response was unique, like her name. Fanny's response was amazing. At just eight years old, she started writing poems about her happiness. She had every reason to feel sorry for herself, but she used her gifts and she wrote over 8,000, 8,000 hymns and poems praising God. Wow, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? 
We know from the Bible that one day Jesus was walking with his disciples when they passed by a blind man. When the disciples saw him, they asked Jesus, who was to blame for this man's blindness? Was it his sin? Was it his parents' sin? But Jesus told the, the disciples that no one was to blame, that this man was blind so that they could see God's works in him. Jesus then healed the man. The man could see, and he praised God, and the people praised God for his goodness. Well, what about Fanny Crosby? God didn't heal her blindness. Perhaps if God had healed her, she might have never written those beautiful hymns, and the world would never know the name Fanny Crosby. The world would never know all of those hymns and sing all of those beautiful songs together, praising God. She used her blindness to praise God. I'm thankful that Fanny Crosby used her story to write music that we can sing together. I'm thankful for music. We don't have the same story as Fanny Crosby, but we can remember that God loves us no matter what. We can remember that God wants us to praise Him. And we can continue to praise God through singing songs. We can praise God through music. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much that you always love us. Thank you that even though there are circumstances around us that are really tough, thank you for the blessings that you give us. God, help us to praise you in all things. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Friends, this week, I want you to email me or text me songs that you like. That's your homework. What song do you like? What songs make you happy? I'll be looking for an email from you, and I'll send out some songs that we've been learning together so that you can listen to those this week. See you next week. Bye, friends. Well, let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. This Lenten season, a most unusual and unforgettable Lenten season, our theme at Brook Hall Baptist Church, our daily devotion theme and our sermon theme has been Eyes on Jesus. And we borrowed the text from Hebrews 12 that says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Here it is. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. And that's what we've been doing this Lenten season. And so today we look at Jesus through the eyes, the denying eyes of Peter. Follow along as I read from God's word. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, even before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the very same thing. Now, still in Mark 14, we move down to the final verses, starting at verse 66. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You are also with that Nazarene Jesus, she said, but he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them, and he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. 
he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know this man that you are talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And Peter broke down and wept. God's word for you and me today. The Bible is full of stories like this, stories that we are very familiar with. The story of Adam and Eve in the garden, the story of Moses and the Ten Commandments, or just pick any of the miracles that Jesus performed. We're familiar with the story. And we know that in this story, Jesus tells Peter, before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. We know the story. We're familiar with the story. But what can we really learn from the denying eyes of Peter? I think the first thing that we can learn is that we can easily overestimate our own strength, our own ability, our own faith. In this scene, in this unfolding story, we see that Peter and the other disciples are overestimating their own faithfulness to Jesus. They are determined to see Jesus. They are determined to stand beside Jesus no matter what comes their way. They think that they can stand beside Jesus with all of their power, with the power that they possess and face any enemy that might come their way. But their reliance on themselves is just an illusion. An illusion is something that appears to be true, but is actually false. Like when a magician uses smoke and mirrors, or when the magician reaches behind your ear and pulls out a coin, the coin wasn't really behind your ear, it was in the magician's hand all along. Thus, the disciples' faith is just an illusion. Put to the test, they fail. Have you ever overestimated your own strength, your own ability, your own faith? For me, it's an everyday occurrence, it seems like. When I was a seminary student, I applied for a job at the rec center as a lifeguard. I had been a lifeguard as an older teenager, and um, when I saw that they were needing a lifeguard, I thought, well, I can do that. So I applied for the job. I filled out the paperwork. I updated my American Red Cross certification. I breezed through the interview, and then the assistant manager said, well, Tom, the job is yours if you can pass the swim test. Are you prepared to do that today? I looked at him and said, no problem, let's do it. But there was a problem. You see, I had been in the pool, but I had not been training to swim laps. And so when he told me, jump in the pool and give me 10 laps, I took off like an Olympic athlete and I swam that first lap easy, record time. But then I hit the wall and I couldn't finish. I couldn't pass the swim test. Yes, I could swim, but not with the strength, not the endurance that a lifeguard really required and needed. I overestimated my ability. And a more timely illustration would be for all of us. We've sat at home on our couches and watched on the news how people are shopping in grocery stores. And we read about stockpiling and hoarding of some products. And we think, why are they doing that? I would never, ever do that. But then when we put ourselves in the grocery store and we see all the people around us getting this or that, and we give in to the temptation to get one more of these or two more of these, no one will ever miss it. And even though we're told just buy like you normally do, we tend to grab a little bit more than we should. So when we say we would never do that, never ever do that, we find ourselves doing what we say we would never do. At some point in our lives, we're around a teacher, a boss, a neighbor, who says that phrase, never say never. And the disciples stand next to Jesus. They look at Jesus and say, never, we will never, ever let you down. But in this text, we learn that Peter does and the other disciples as well. What about you? Do you stand strong or do you overestimate your strength and your faith? We often, the flip side of that, we over or we rather we underestimate God's unfailing love. Even though it's buried within this text and it's not obviously on the surface of this text, 
God's unfailing love is present in this sad scene. Jesus knows the failings of the disciples, but he chooses to love them anyway. Surely one of the most important points of this story is that Jesus knows the weaknesses and failures of the disciples, and he loves them anyway. Who of us has not experienced that with a parent? As a child, we've let them down, disappointed them, but our mother, our father, loved us anyway. Jesus has been communicating the unending love of God throughout his ministry. Most notably, we see that in the story of the prodigal son and how God's love for that, the, the father's son, love for the son is not shaken. It endures. So let's take from this text, we should never underestimate God's unfailing love for you and me. God's unfailing love for people halfway around the world and people halfway across our city. The final thing that we can learn from this is that we can benefit from knowing the weaknesses of others. As we know, Mark paints a rather dismal picture of the disciples throughout his gospel. They denied Jesus, they betrayed Jesus, they deserted Jesus. In fact, this is, for them, the last time we read about the disciples in the Gospel of Mark. They don't show up again in the Gospel. But after Jesus is raised from the dead, the women are told, Go and tell my disciples and Peter, I will meet them in Galilee. Even though these disciples have set the bar fairly low, Jesus cherishes them and loves them and every day calls these imperfect disciples to action to advance the kingdom of God. Uh, in the Gospel of Mark earlier, Jesus says, If anyone would come after me, he or she must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So in this text, Peter denied Jesus, yet Jesus called him and he calls me to deny ourselves and follow Jesus. May you and I follow Jesus for the glory of God. May God bless you. Thank you for joining us for a time of worship. We pray and hope that you were able to experience the presence of God during our worship service this morning. We pray for you, and if you need anything, please let us know, let the church office know, and we will reach out to you and help in any way that we can. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you very soon.